Torture. Yeah. yeah it's the torture museum. It was there years ago, but yeah. this exhibit wasn't. No, this was used in the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Welcome to Real Siblings, It Ain't Easy, a real estate podcast with the goal to educate, inform, and save their listeners time as they navigate the market and properties in their neighborhoods. Get ready to join real-life siblings and professional real estate advisors, Donna Reed and Eric Seaman, as they discuss how it may be simple, but it ain't always easy. Every time I think about the places I have known, I realize that times have changed. So I'll do what I can to make this house into a home. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Real Siblings. It ain't easy. A real estate podcast that just ain't typical. I'm Donna, and this is Eric, and we are the Real Siblings. We are both professional realtors with Keller Williams. And just for your reference, he lives on about 13 acres in the hill country. I live in a townhouse in the city. The podcast blends lifestyle together with real estate as we work to communicate, educate, connect, speculate. Oh, I like that word here. And, <laughs> and, and entertain our listeners. While the topics, vary, <laughs> the topics do vary and our conversations go in many directions. We work to provide the listeners with insights into our industry, better equipping you and anyone who's listening for your next real estate transaction. <laughs> Eric. <laughs> Hey, sister, you can't change things up like that. You can't. I, I wanted to say educate and speculate because I liked that. Speculate. <laughs> so what's going on? Well, sister, you know what's going on. And my sister co-host has finished yet another trip to the other side of the globe. And we're going to visit on that today. Since our past discussion of the 2022 trip has played so well. People apparently like to hear about my sisters cavorting around the globe. There you go. <laughs> but before we get into that, I want to, I'll say recap, maybe review. So in previous episode, just the previous episode, we talked about the reticular activator. And when I was beginning that discussion, I said, scientifically, pause, I sum it up as, so I didn't really give you the scientific what the reticular activator is. If you'll excuse me, I will be reading this because there's a lots of big words in here that I don't normally use. So your reticular activator, the descending reticulospinal and ascending hypothalamic basal forebrain and thalamocortical systems. These three states develop and occur in a predictable manner. And we can explain these states according to the firing properties of neurons based on their intrinsic membrane properties, their synaptic and neurochemical connectivity, and their responsiveness to, final words here, sensory inputs. So my summary was, we see and observe what is on our mind. From a real estate perspective, it happens all the time. Maybe something as simple as you're considering a move. Or maybe you just even saw a commercial on TV about moving or watching your favorite HGTV or DIY show on the telly. Your mind's now engaged. And the next time you're in your car, you're taking a walk in your neighborhood, you're on your bike. Suddenly it looks like there's been an explosion of for sale signs in a yard. And it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't know my neighbor was selling their house. And it's like, they're three doors down but you weren't thinking about it. It wasn't important and it was kind of white noise. And now that whatever made that trigger, you're seeing it for the first time. And Donna and I discussed the fact that how she attended, attended, participated, took your trip and what you saw last year was a little bit different than it was this year, 12 months later, having these kind of discussions on an ongoing basis. So, with we're, that, not gonna get, we're not going to get quizzed on any of that scientific stuff, are we? Uh, yes. Oh, Lordy. Test will be following. <laughs> Neurochemical oh. connectivity. Got it. Got it. <laughs> What's it what, so that all leads us to the yep. great wall behind you. Yeah. So I did a river cruise this summer. I did one last summer. Um, it got interrupted because of COVID. This year I was in Germany. 
my brother made me look up the sequence of the rivers I was on. So I started on the main or the mine, actually, that's how they say it, and then the Rhine and the Mosul. And we, uh, you know, so lots of little, little towns along the way. And this particular town was actually one of my favorites. It was called Wertheim. And partly was my favorite. Which is Wertheim. Wertheim. You're right. You're right. The guide was great. Um, she knew people in town. She lived there forever. But what was fascinating to me is we, we came across this lot and there's very few lots. Behind me is a picture that I took of what had what had been a torn down home that some younger people were going to buy. And in the tearing down process, they discovered that the basement of the neighbor's property encroached on theirs. So as a result, nothing has been built to connect this house to the next one. What this did for me as a realtor is it, I, I told Eric earlier when we were planning that it it opened up this, like a museum of the ancient house. Because you see the old wood structure with the rocks shoved in there, probably being held by, together by mud or cement or whatever. Yeah. So, some sort of what they might refer to as a daub, which yeah. I think is D- D-A-U-B, yeah. daub. And yeah, yeah. And then you and look then at like, that timber frame and we were talking about it. That type of architecture using the timber frame goes back to, in England, what would be the Tudor times and Henry VIII. Yep. So 600 year old wall. Yep. Yep. And then stucco over top. So this particular building, the stucco really could be Tucson. It's like the same tan color that we use. There is know? a lot of tan in Germany on the buildings. They really yeah. do a lot of that. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. But what was also interesting, so the house that uh, we lived in that we've talked about before, the Victorian home on Lynn Street, when the neighbor was selling her property, we found out that our garage slash dad's shop had been four to six feet on her property forever. So if you went back to the old plot and divides land uh, designs in town, it had been that way forever. So seeing this here and hearing that story, just made me sort of laugh that, oh, you know, some things never change. Our- and, and encroachments are always an issue. That's why we do surveys. That's why title looks at it. And that's why yeah. it's important yeah. to see those things ahead of time to go, oh my goodness, we have an issue. Donna, I know you're looking at the picture like we are now because it's posted yeah. behind you. Yeah. The place or the area where the trees are growing up is yeah, that's, where the building is supposed to be being reconstructed, or that's the area of the encroachment? That's the fence. That's the fence at the front of the property. You can't go in. And then if I lean over, you can see a little bit of plastic that's covering some of the lower parts, which I don't know what that means for the people living next door. But uh, there's a fence across the front with essentially a do not enter sign. And then you can just barely see the edge of the other building on the other side. Nobody knows. Nobody knows when it'll be taken care of, how it'll be taken care of. When I say nobody, our guide. That was our nobody. <laughs> you know, it isn't like I talked to town town people that were right. There. The the owners were not there to have a conversation with them. Auf Deutsch and yeah, that didn't happen. So anyway, yeah, the the reticular activating system and things that the younger Donna would never have cared thought about, about cared about, or even a year ago. Maybe do, not. Do you think- I don't know. I've started on every trip. I've started paying more attention. I've paid attention to plugs and showers and toilets and flooring and steps up and steps down and all the things that come up that, you know, if if you live on the third floor in that building next to you, you have a curvy staircase all the way up to the third floor. It's probably not a single family residence. And you're carrying your groceries and they use it like in Chicago, they'd call that a three flat. Yeah. But it is not uncommon in German architecture for a stairwell to have a family on the lower level on either side of the stairwell and then above and then above and and above. And yeah. the buildings are old enough. We know by looking at the walls, they didn't have lifts or elevators at that time to get you to the top floor. No. Nope. Which exactly. is why when you were in Germany, I appreciated all the more that the Getrinken man would come and deliver me a case of 20 bottles of Hefeweizen into my door. And I didn't have to go to it. Uh, Aww, what a wonderful, care. wonderful thing that happened there. <laughs> Good Lord. Hey, I have to add to this is totally unrelated and yet maybe related. So this is the town also where I made the pretzel. 
and I had told you in advance that the the pretzel maker in this little bakery, you all, was 13th generation. And so beforehand, Eric and I were like, what's a generation? Is it 20 years? Is it 25? So we took 20 years, which means that for 260 years, his family has been running this little bakery. in this And little- making pretzels. And making pretzels, along with other baked goods. And then I wondered, the, the next part of me is like, I wonder if he has a child that wants to take over or not. And- you know? Well, the, the child, but European history here in the United States, outside of the Civil War and the Revolutionary War, we have been pretty unscathed by mm-hmm. war and battle and things like that. Yeah. And you think what Germany has yeah. survived. Yeah. And that town, Wertheim, along the river, and I'm leading on down the road. Behind me is a picture of Schweinfurt, which I still have because I was lived in and stationed in Schweinfurt. And one of the buildings in, say, I got to turn the right way, right over here on the on the corner is what's known as the Zoig House. And the Zoig House was home of the Tagblatt, which was the local newspaper. And there are cannonballs embedded in the wall from wow. medieval times embedded in the wall. You can, wow. dr- you can still see them in pictures. I follow Schweinfurt on Instagram and they show, posted a picture recently and it's like, name this building. And sure enough, the cannonballs are still there embedded in the walls and different sizes. Some of them that would be only about a three inch to uh, a five or six inch cannonball in the side. And that was another one. You caught Schweinfurt when you were cruising down the river. Why? Because I knew that one of my brothers had been based there. So I, I, I took a picture. I don't even remember if I sent it to you guys right away or, but I, but I texted and I was like, weren't one of you didn't one of you live here <laughs> and and so yeah i i think i basically i talked to dna and to you and find out that yes that's where you had been based and thus you also knew several of the other little towns that i was going by and stopping at because it was in the neighborhood where you hamburg and Wertheim and yeah yeah, yeah sure yeah. sure did sure did so cool. aside from those you this was a cruise and you actually successfully made it through the whole cruise this year I right <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And you were on, you started on the mine and what other rivers did you? And then we were on the Rhine and went through Bavaria, which is kind of the see all the castle kind of places. And then, and that's also Riesling country, which was great fun. And then we ended in Luxembourg. And Osbach country. Or the, the Mosul. Yeah, that's what you keep saying. You know, I think the reason we talked about that chocolate is because when I did the Up With People reunion, somebody brought chocolate to taste. I don't know. I'm trying to remember why you... Yeah, why that's of your mind. Okay, what, and then you were also in Nuremberg. Yes, started. Right, one of your stops, Nuremberg. and that's one of the ones where you took, you didn't take a picture of an old 600-year-old wall. You took pictures of roof tiles. Tile roofs, yeah. So, you know, the house that we used, that we were living in um, with mom and dad had slate tile, slate shingles and rooftop until dad had to take that down and the wood corbels and made it, well, the the corbels that went away, and then there was just vinyl right around, and the roof was shingles, just regular shingles. Right, composition shingles, composition as we refer to them. Yeah. So as I'm looking at the tile, and now I live in a place where we have a lot of red tile here, and homeowners associations want you to match the tile from 40 years ago, which amuses me. But the tiles were tri- laid triangularly. And when you had a peak in a roof, a dormer of sorts, or if you've ever been to Europe, you know, these tiny little top story windows, they literally looked like a deck of cards where somebody had just shoved one underneath the other around this peak so that water could come down. And to be honest, Eric, I don't know how they were attached. They don't look like they could have been nailed in. I don't know if there's glue. Unless they're so much longer underneath that you just didn't even know. That could be, that could be if it was, if it looked like a diamond on the outside, but it was much like more of a star or something. Because honestly, one of the restoration shows I watched just this past weekend, which is Restoration Man, which is a British, the roof tiles on that were probably close to two feet long and they had an overlap of about two thirds. So about six Mm -hmm. inches would have been exposed six to eight inches and the other 12, 16, 18 inches were overlapped so it a ba- basically one shingle was lapped three times you had what was exposed uh, and then a middle and then a top yeah. moving on up the roof line well and and the other thing then that was interesting for me is so then my friend from up with people picked me up 
she lives in Frankfurt, but she picked me up and she, um, and we, we were then cruising by the Slate Mountains and the Slate the- Mountains. <laughs> I'm sure they have another name. They have a better sure. name than that. Along, along the Rhine River, you know, you can see the slate and those then rooftops, same, put together the same way, but with slate. So, you know, we've talked in past episodes about limestone in San Antonio and about brick, our brick home and about adobe here, how people used what was available. I asked, um, Christine is her name. I, I asked her about her house and, and she said they had redone the roof and they chose to do it with the slate so that it looked, they needed a new roof, but they wanted it to still. And who was that? Someone from up with people that I served on the, and she, she's a, she was a tour guide. In okay. Frankfurt. So she's, this is someone who was uh, the tour guide on the trip. No, no, no. She just, just someone met. you ran into, you coordinated she, a trip. We coordinated. She picked me up. We went to a winery. I tasted some Riesling and some cheese ball thing. I don't know what it was. And then we went to the, um, (laughs) really great with my history here. I, we both had had a friend who was a doctor using Hildegard von Bingen's techniques with natural things. And we were very close to there. So we drove there and saw the church and place where she was. And then a monastery. And my friend and her husband had been at a concert in this monastery the night before. So here we were in this ancient building watching them take down the sound system that had been there the day before. So evidence of not of repurposing everything, not tearing things down, which I love. So I think Europe does a much better job of preserving their history right. than we do, as is evidence behind you. Yeah. How many times has that building been had renovated, had restored, fixed, it patched. Yeah. I mean, if you were in and around that area, historically, what you may not have gotten on your tour is Schweinfurt in Germany was the heart of the ball bearing industry for Germany. Oh, and during World War II, some of the largest air battles in the war occurred over Schweinfurt. As the Allied forces were trying to bomb out the ball bearing plants, Wow. In order to shut down the ability for Germany to manufacture bearings for all of their equipment. So when I was stationed there, it was not uncommon for a building like that to not only have the encroachment there, but have to call in bomb disposal because there's unexploded ordnance buried all over that region of the country that farmers are digging and all of a sudden tink and they have to pull half ton ammunition out of the ground that's been buried in the mud since the 1940s happened all the time so i talked about medieval cannonballs in the wall of a building now you've talking about unexploded munitions that have been sitting underground rusting for 80 years now yeah Yeah. some of of those were dropped at that point right right it's so food you've mentioned wine and you mentioned some sort of a cheese ball-y kind of thing was there anything (laughs) Anything else? Well, well, and the pretzels, of course, which, by the way, I learned that if a pretzel is older than three or four hours, it's not good. And since I made a pretzel and I had already been given a pretzel, I took one of them with me and he was right and I threw it away. Oh, (laughs) yeah. You go to those pretzels places and if you get one where they've made the pretzels in advance and then kind of put them in some sort of a warmer. Yeah. Yeah. They're rubbish. They're they're, they're just... Yeah. yeah, no amount of mustard, no amount of dipping sauce makes up for a dry, cakey pretzel. Yeah. 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 There was there was one other thing that was kind of interesting to me because last year when I went to Brussels, my girlfriend made a tart out of a specific plum that I had never heard of. And of course, that's right. No, was that part of the dessert pizza? Yeah. Yeah, it looked. And so here I am in Mirabel is what they're called. And I knew that a good portion grew in the Lorraine region, like 80% of France. And so when we got to Luxembourg and I was super close, I took the train and went to France. And sure enough, here's a big market with a big display of these Mirabels, which until last year, I had never heard of. You had never heard of. Yeah. So the food's always fascinating for a person that worked in the food industry. You know, what's up? Always totally bio, so non-processed in these little towns. You know, we, we eat what is available and in season kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So part of the reason that 
one of your pictures, and I'm pretty confident. I know you're saying you don't remember it, but Osbach is a brandy that's brewed, uh, brewed distilled on the river. And I had, I had some- picked up, they not only do they make the Osbach or Alt brandy, but they make chocolates. And it's dark chocolates, foil wrapped, little liqueur chocolates like you can get around the holidays. They're very popular at different stores. So I had some of those picked up. While I was in another room at one point, Jamie decided she was going to swipe a chocolate. With brandy in it. And from the other room, you hear this, "Ah!" she's got dark chocolate running down her face and she's in (laughs) tears. And I'm trying so hard to be the concerned dad cleaning her up and at the same time trying not to laugh hysterically at the fact that she thought she was sneaking a chocolate and got the brandy and oh, too funny. yeah there's probably some bad fathering in there at some place or is a, that what would now be considered that and it was just well, eric and, and you know while i don't know while you were based there but one of the other things that was fascinating to me you know this is all beer country too you start in munich uh so we i flew to munich and then from munich we took a bus to nuremberg the last time I had a beer was 1977 at the Dude Ranch. So I, I don't do beer. So I was really happy to get to the wine country. The Dude Ranch in? Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Okay. Yeah. I knew that, but our listeners didn't. I know. I know. <laughs> so the the beer was fascinating. And because we would go in and they would say, this is a medieval city. This is a Roman city. It became kind of a joke because everywhere we went had some piece of that. But what you found out is the water was so bad that everybody drank beer. The kids from the time they were infants drank beer now with way less alcohol content than today. But that was because that was what cleaned the beer. And we drove by fields of hops and I took pictures and sent those to my kids because they like beer and all the local little little breweries. That was, I don't know, for whatever, I had this random weird image of a child right after nursing having beer, you know, so I don't well. know. <laughs> That's one of those things that we make it seem like developing industry, I'll say even in the last 25 years in the United States, is the microbrewery. Right. That so many people it's like, hey, I can do this at home. I can get slightly bigger equipment and now I can sell it and make a living yeah. doing what I love and making microbrew or small breweries. And yeah. Germany, every single town you look at, it, it's like there's not enough people here to support a brewery. Yet there's always one guest house making its own beer in every town and they're all bottling it it's it's really such a way of life yeah Yeah. in there because here it needs to be a bigger city in order to be able to support it if you don't have the business it costs so much to do it you're not going to be in business yeah yeah but there it's yep we do this and this is it and so there was one other thing that you took a picture of that was particular note it was a quiz for your siblings and it was a picture of a wagon it was. It yeah. wasn't just a wagon. It wasn't just a wagon. I I truly was like the most excited person on this tour <laughs> when, I, when I found out we were going to go there. And what I told you it was in Rotenburg, right? At the Rotenburg um, of the town over. Yep. The town, uh, at the museum of what did torture. I tell you? Torture. Yeah. yeah it's the torture museum. It everything. was there years ago, but yeah. this exhibit wasn't. No, this was used in the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and it's when the bad guy captures the child the- catcher. Child catcher. If you haven't seen Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, then shame on you. But that's beside the point. And so, yeah, it's displayed outside the museum, and I didn't go in the museum. Mostly, that was the men on the tour that went in the museum, while the wives did other things. But um, shopped and drank wine. Shopped and drank wine. No, the men drank beer. That's that was a beer town. <laughs> But it was fascinating to see that. And the other thing is, is that there's stuff that's filmed there based on the way it looks in old movies. So when that cart, you're going to have to go back to Chitty Chitty Bang Bang now and stop it. It comes around the corner and the man that played the child catcher was a trained ballet dancer. And the thing fell over. The, it was the, top heavy and he took the yeah. turn too fast. And it fell over on the cobblestone. But because he was a trained dancer, he just danced off the thing and they never they never had to change it or take it out of the movie. So those are the kinds of trivia things that I love to find out when I travel. And I hope someday when I'm at a bar in a trivia game that that's the question. <laughs> that's, that's that the question. I think that's fair enough. I think that's fair enough. So anything else that you made pretzels, you had a glass of wine or two. 
I had a, I actually I up, had a beer you know, in Munich. Ended up on a whiskey tasting on the back of the ship that because one of the five guys that won it didn't show up and my room was right next to that room. And I don't. So they came a knocking on your door, sister. No, what were you up to? That I just, I just opened the door and I was going to go in that space. And they were in there and I walked in and, they, and I go, oh, is this your whiskey tasting? They go, yeah, come on. And so-and-so didn't show up. I don't even, I don't even know what I'm trying to taste when I taste whiskey. And they're, they're all talking about these flavors. And all I know is that it would cure you if you had a chest cold. That was my thought on the whiskey. Did, so. did they, as part of the whiskey tasting, tell you how best to get the nose that you have to keep your mouth open when you inhale? <laughs> because then the, the, the scent comes down over your tongue. Nobody and it enhances me, the sensation that you of smelling? No, nobody told me that. But because I had done that with wine and because I watched everybody else swirl things and look at them and all that, you know, just like every every person buying or going and getting a glass of wine pretending they know what they're doing. <laughs> that was that was super interesting for me too, because it actually was our ship, it was something that was won in a fundraiser for autism. And five guys from the ship got to do it. And it was our ship. Five guys, they run a burger place now, right? Yeah, that's true. Our ship tour guide that it was his, he's from Germany and it was his whiskey that he had brought on board at, for, and they got to taste. So that was. Wow. Very nice. Very and nice. Fun. Yeah. You know, one other thing, Eric, that I mentioned to you about, I don't know, it's not, it's not real estate per se. It's, it has to do with, you know, we talked about redoing old homes and all that, but in Luxembourg, I was with the man who had been my physical therapist here in Tucson, because he's from Luxembourg. And we were looking at a bridge. There's lots of bridges, right? And he said, and there's also lots of cyclists. That are centuries old. Right, right. And this, and and high, because they're way above, you know, the rivers. Because Luxembourg City has a, an old town down below and an uptown. <laughs> I'm really bad with my words with these. Anyway, they there there's so many uh, cyclists on the road that they built underneath the main road, they built another road, essentially, that is for the right, the walkers, the bikers, the joggers, and everybody else. And to me, that that's just brilliant. Now, where I live, it's flat in a valley. We don't even have those big bridges. It would make no sense to do that. But I love that they care about their people enough to say, huh, maybe we should get all these bike riders off the road with all the cars because this is the only way to cross right here. And they create that space, so. Yeah, uh, that would be something that uh, f- future episode I could discuss about some issues going on here in San Antonio hmm. where the city passed a bond issue thinking that they owned the road and then the Texas Department of Transportation came through and said, no, no, that's a highway. That's our road. And so now nothing's been done. Oh, interesting. With millions of dollars being allocated to it. So that's yeah. life in the big city, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, what do we got? Do we need to wrap it up? Is it time to go? That is probably it for the day. You've talked enough about your travels. Oh, any adventures on the way home? Wait, didn't you have flight trouble? Yeah, we, uh, the way over was perfect. I was 40 minutes late. Perfect. The way back. Um, we spent a whole day just in airports in Germany and because we left Luxembourg late. And so we ended up staying. And what was the reason for that? Was it weather? Was it fog? Was it what? what it was whatever the airline was leaving Luxembourg. And Luxembourg reminded me a little of leaving Denver, where you feel like you could drive to the next city. I truly, we could have taken the train to Munich and flown from there. <laughs> yeah, well, that's another one of those things that, yeah, you haven't ever used public transportation in Tucson, but you could you would climb on a train in Europe in a heartbeat. That's exactly what I did. Luxembourg right? to transfer. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. yeah. But 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 they were we were Lufthansa and they were very good to us. They put us up in the hotel at the airport, covered everything so that the next morning and then we had a, a flight home with no no issues. So Okay. So did you give them a five star Google review? I didn't do any Google review. I was just grateful my suitcase came too. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, she celebrates her her suitcase making it home with her. I want to say thanks for spending your time with us today. We reminisce about how lifestyle and real estate blend and have brought us to where we're at today in our careers. As we close this episode, remember, we are both professional real estate agents and we both work for Keller Williams. I'm with Keller Williams Heritage in, in San Antonio, Texas. 
and Don is with Keller Williams Southern Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. If you're looking for a place in those areas, please reach out and give us a call. We'll see if we can help you. And if you're listening around the United States or around the world, we have, are connected with a plethora of agents around the globe. You've heard Don has got connections here, there, riverboat cruises, making pretzels, whatever the case may be. We can get you connected. Yeah. Give us a shout. Let us help out. <laughs> <laughs> Our goal is to help you find the perfect property for you to call home, create lasting memories, and build your wonderful life. Remember, it may be simple. It ain't always easy. And until next time, I'm Eric. And I'm Donna. And we are the Real Siblings. Oh, sibling. Every time I think about the places I have known. I realize that times have changed So I'll do what I can To make this house Into a home Yeah, yeah oh. Hi, I'm Annabelle And I want to thank you for investing your valuable time In listening to Real Sibling at Amy. I hope you found this episode informative and enjoyable. There are several ways you can support this podcast with my grandpa Eric and Aunt Grandma. Please take the time to like, follow, and subscribe. Additionally, leave them a five-star rating along with a review on your preferred podcast platform. The final thing I would ask is that you recommend this podcast to a friend, a family member, or an associate. Your engagement is critical to their ongoing success, and they look forward to connecting. Check out the show notes Grandpa put together with their contact information, including emails, phone numbers, and website. And remember, the real siblings look forward to hearing from you.